Well, good morning. Welcome. My name is Wayne. I'm glad to in just welcome you to our worship service for Lighthouse Christian Church, where our mission is to share God's grace and truth so that people come to know and love and serve Jesus. And we're very passionate about that. We're glad that you can join us for worship today. One of the things that we studied earlier this year, we studied through the Gospel of John, and there's a wonderful verse in John chapter 4, a wonderful passage where Jesus has an encounter with this woman in Samaria, the woman at the well. We don't know her name. But Jesus says to her, Woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews, meaning that Jesus came from the Jews. And yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. And I take that to mean that we're going to worship according to the word of God, and we're going to hear teaching from the word of God and respond to that teaching. And we want to acknowledge that the Holy Spirit is here among us, desiring to reveal God to us and to draw us close to the Father's heart. Worship is very vital. Worship is when we receive God's revelation and hopefully see him more clearly in order that we might love him more dearly. So worship is the revelation of God and then our response. And we respond by standing and singing or uh, praying or giving offering and especially the response of the offering up of our lives to the Lord. So worship is, is vital. And then worship is a revelation of God and response to God in the context of relationships. And that's one of the reasons, actually, I'm very excited that uh, starting next week, we're going to a larger venue. So starting next week, we're going to start worshiping Lighthouse Church at Eastside Christian School, um, 10 a.m. Saturday mornings. And I hope that all of you will join us, uh, those here today. Let's hear from you if you're here today. Welcome. Let's hear from you. <laughs> all right. It's really been great to be able to not only worship the Lord, but to do so uh, with others in community. And those of you online, welcome, and I hope that uh, you'll consider coming out and joining us next week at, at Eastside Christian School, 10 o'clock Saturday. Uh, we're going to ask you to sign up on our website. If you've been vaccinated, masks are optional, but uh, we're going to have a good time. And the following week, uh, on August 7th, we will actually reopen in-person children's ministry as well. So next week will be kind of a soft opening, inviting everybody to come back, and the following week we'll have a uh, another kind of opening because the children and hopefully many families will rejoin us. And I am so looking forward uh, to worshiping together as a community. So I hope you'll consider coming out for us, with us. Uh, also, let's see, a few other things I want to mention. Uh, one is that we have an events bulletin board on our website. And we want to encourage you to check out that events bulletin board because uh, it includes some upcoming events and uh, we've got some wonderful things coming up and I just want you to be aware of that. Also one of them, and we just praise God for this, is that we will be able to serve at Jubilee Service Day um, at Phantom Lake Elementary School, the school where we have met since 2008 all the way up until COVID. And uh, we're gonna be serving there on Saturday morning, August 28th, uh, just for the morning from 8 a.m. to noon. And we would love for uh, a lot of our people to come and serve that school and continue to foster our connection and relationship with the community, the staff, uh, the students at Phantom Lake Elementary School. We're basically helping the teachers and staff and faculty get ready for the start of the new school year. So we will help them in many ways. Often it involves helping them set up classrooms and, and different things that teachers need to do to help get ready for the students to come. Uh, you can visit our website for complete Jubilee Service Day information and sign up instructions. We're all gonna sign up through Jubilee Reach. And uh, when you sign up through Jubilee Reach, then look for the, uh, the school, Phantom Lake Elementary, and indicate that's where you wanna serve. And then when you go to that page, it'll say, if, it'll ask if you have church affiliation. So just say you're with Lighthouse, and then they will make sure to place you at Phantom Lake Elementary so we can serve together. Many schools throughout Bellevue will be served by many churches, but our church will especially focus on uh, Phantom Lake Elementary School. Okay, now, if you were with us last week, you know that I introduced some guests from Los Angeles, uh, Mike and Grace Park, and I said that they were, uh, he's our candidate for um, our, our position, which is pastor of missions and outreach. 
And it's been really exciting. Uh, we had a lot of good meetings and sessions uh, over the last several weeks. And we decided to uh, make Mike an offer to become our pastor of missions and outreach. And this week, he accepted that offer. And so we're excited to announce that Mike and Grace Park and their family will be joining us uh, starting next month, starting in August. And uh, there's a short gre greeting from them, so I want you to watch this. Hi, Hi everyone. everyone. My name is Mike. That's my wife, Grace, and this is our family. Hi, I'm Annika, and I'm a sophomore in college, and I'm really looking forward to trying out all the new food up there. Hi, I'm Kaylin. I'm going to be a senior in high school, and I'm excited about seeing more rain. <laughs> Hi, I'm Chloe, and I'm going into the seventh grade, and I can't wait to see more snow up there. And all of us are very excited to be a part of the community at Lighthouse Christian Church, and uh, we hope to see you all very soon. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Okay, very cool. And you'll have a chance to meet them and get to know them in the coming months, the coming weeks and months. Um, but yeah, that's Mike and Grace and their, their daughters, uh, Annika, uh, Kaylin, and Chloe. And we're excited to have them join us. They, they have been pastoring at uh, my father's house, Covenant Church in Los Angeles, for about the last six or seven years. And before that, they were missionaries in China. Okay, uh, at this time I want to invite uh, you to worship the Lord and respond to him uh, with the giving of your tithes and offerings. Uh, you can write a check to Lighthouse Christian Church and mail it to the church office. Uh, you can also give online, and if you go to our website, there'll be instructions about how to give online. I just want to say thank you to all those who have been faithfully uh, supporting uh, Lighthouse and the work that we're doing and the mission that we're trying to carry out faithfully uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ. But we cannot do it without your prayers, without your encouragement and help, and without your financial support as well. So thanks for all those, to all those who've been uh, faithfully supporting uh, the work that God is doing here. All right, let's uh, join together in prayer. Well, we do thank you, Lord, for you are doing a good work, and we're humbled by it, and we're thankful for it. Thank you for seeing us through this last year and a half of COVID pandemic, and we know it's been really hard on many people, including the children. And we do ask, Lord, that you would help us uh, to come out of this well. We pray for your continued protection over our health. We pray for wisdom and discernment about decisions that people need to make regarding schooling, regarding church, regarding work, and regarding our community and fellowship. And Lord, we do pray for our opening uh, next week at Eastside Christian School and, and ask that you would go before us and that uh, we would have the help that we need, that people would step forward to serve again and that we could just enjoy fellowship and worship together as the people of God in a corporate gathering. And Lord, we want to pray for uh, Mike and Grace Park and their, and their daughters and uh, pray that you will go before them. Thank you for providing them to, to join us and ask that you'll be with them in all the stress and hassle of moving, that you'll provide them a good place to live here and uh, you will bless their ministry uh, with us, Lord. I just want to pray too that you will continue to uh, guide us as we seek to fill our two other uh, staff openings uh, for pastor of worship and for associate uh, director of children's ministry and lord that you would raise up the those that you would have join us thank you that you've always been faithful in providing for our church lord we pray today for those who are uh, anxious and hurting those are in who are in financial stress those who are endangered by depression uh, those who live with fear lord we pray that you would draw near to us as we draw near to you that we might call on the name of the lord that we might uh, rejoice in your love for us and in the salvation that you offer through your son jesus christ and we pray now that as we worship you that your spirit would fill us that we will be able to uh, receive your revelation and respond in adoration obedience and with the offering of our lives and may you be glorified in all that we do and say. We pray in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Would you please rise, if you can, for worship? Good morning. You know, it seems like lately I've been hearing a lot of not-so-good news. People losing jobs, people uh, passing away. Uh, people being diagnosed with um, terminal illness 
and you know we thought we're going through the pandemic and finishing it out and now it seems like some of that is coming back and you know there's, there's lots of negative things and I tend to think what's going on you know why is this happening and yet you know I've been studying the book of Acts a lot lately and that tells us that the reason we are given the Holy Spirit is so that we can give the testimony that Jesus Christ is Son of God and Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And so instead of thinking, why is this happening? If we start thinking about how will God use us in this situation to be witnesses for Jesus Christ, then we start thinking, okay, well, the grace that God gives us is enough. Jesus is more than enough it's for us to tell our story about Jesus and how he affects us. And by that, we can be witnesses to the world. So those are the kind of the songs that we'll be singing today.
pray together. Lord, may it be our uh, deep wanting and desire to tell the story of who you are, of your glory, of of, of Jesus Christ and his love for us. So Lord, as we hear your word today, Be glorified. Uh, May your spirit uh, instill, renew, transform hearts here and those who hear the message today. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the gospel grace that you have shown through Christ and the story that we're called to tell of our lives, of your faithfulness, a testimony of your grace despite no matter what happens, good or bad, we have the story to tell of your faithfulness, your truth, your holiness, your power, for your glory, for your honor, for your fame. It's all about you, Lord, and we worship you today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may take your seats. Well, good morning. My name is Paul, and I serve as one of the pastors here, and I'll be sharing the message for you today. Uh, It's great to be here with all of you, uh, those who are watching on screen as well. Great to be here with you. Um, And today, um, I'm filling my almost one-year quota of preaching once a year. (laughs) So so I'm glad to, to deliver the gospel message to you. Uh, Over the past four weeks, we were seeking practical ways to live out the gospel where we live and work through BLESS, um, the acronym BLESS, uh, where we B, begin with prayer, L, listen with intention, E, eat together with people that we're praying for and listening to, and S, serve others by meeting their needs in impactful ways. And today, we conclude the BLESS series with our last S in story sharing the story of God in your life. I'm going to take a stab in the dark and say that I'm not the only one here in this room who believes that maybe this particular S 
story is the most challenging one out of all the missional practices. Now, for those who just love building relationships and, and sharing your story and witnessing is like second nature, and I can think of a few in this room and even in our own church, I applaud you guys because you guys are so extroverted and you guys have that gift. Uh, me, I'm scared and I'll talk about that later. Um, there's this famous quote by St. Francis, Francis of Assisi that goes, preach the gospel at all times. When necessary, use words. But some like to change the when necessary to if necessary. Because if a person can show the gospel just through their actions, I don't think many people would talk. And it kind of gives an excuse for people not to share, especially when the gospel lived out requires the speaking portion backed by, backed by one's own actions. That's what James 1.22 says. You can love people, serve people, care for people, and model a great life. Your actions will nudge people. They will create curiosity. They will open hearts to an interest in the gospel. Others may even model your actions. And this is a great thing. But there comes a time or a moment where you will need to share your story. You need to talk. Romans 10, 17 tells us that there are certain truths. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. At some point along the way, everyone needs to hear and comprehend the gospel story. It might be through your story from start to finish. Sin and redemption, death and resurrection, and why that matters. Dave Ferguson, the author of Bless, uh, says this, but the truth is if we're beginning with prayer, listening intently, eating with them, and serving people where we work and have developed relationships with, there will be times when we get the opportunity to share the story of Jesus. We need to be wise and sensitive about it in what we say, but when we get a chance, we gotta take it. Can't spell bless with one S. To bless the world like God wants us to, there will be times when words will be necessary. We all have a story to tell about God's work in our lives. Briefly, what's a story? Your story is your testimony about how God, how Jesus, and how the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, has changed your life that you share with others in a clear and concise way. We follow Christ moving from unbelief to faith in every part of life, and we recall how God has been faithful and good to you, to each of us, and how the grace and goodness of Jesus changed your past, present, and future. And we share that all. But I add, you know, sharing your story made, for me, for us here, Sharing our stories doesn't have to be like rocket science. So complicated and challenging that you put so much pressure on yourself, I'm speaking on, about me, that you end up not sharing at all. And I, as I say this to you, again, I say, say this to me over and over again, it doesn't have to be challenging for us to share our stories of faith in Christ. So I'm gonna go three points today. Why we share our story, number one. Two, our reluctances to share our story. And three, a simple way to share our story, uh, all derived from this blessed book. Number one, why we share our stories. And if you have your scripture with you on your phones or in your, the real Bibles. <laughs> Sorry, I was like, I kind of forgot. Uh, if you can open up to 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, and I'll be reading from the ESV, the English Standard Version. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, that you too may have fellowship with us and indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. 
And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. We share because one, because of our fellowship with one another as a result of our fellowship with God. You see here, the disciples witnessed the word of life, Jesus Christ, his life, death, resurrection in the most real way. In person, he, they saw him. Everything about Jesus that he said about himself, they believed that it was true. That the eternal life, and that's why John is taught, saying these things, the eternal life is made manifest now because they believed in them. And this, what they saw is now a reality and it fills them with awe and wonder. They have been in relationship with the word of life and the eternal life and now are in fellowship through him to what is now the churches that they're ministering to. And as a result of that, they can't help but proclaim Christ, word of life, as the word of life, so that all who read this, and that includes us, may be in fellowship with them and with one another. Fellowship, in the Greek, it means koinonia, and it means Believers in Christ coming together in love, faith, and encouragement. It's being in agreement with one another, united in purpose, and serving alongside each other. We witness this in the, the growth of Christianity throughout church history, throughout the book of Acts. First, the ministry of Paul, the disciples, who make disciples, who make disciples, who make disciples, and it goes on and then throughout church history and even today and hopefully more and more till Jesus returns. Their joy will be complete now and in the time to come if they hold fast to Christ and one another, persevering in the current trial that they're in because of their fellowship with God. God graciously reminds us through scripture of the importance of our witness in our lives we are exhorted and encouraged out of our trust in God to be equipped and prepared to give the reason for the hope that we have with gentleness and respect. And this is what Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. We who have seen Jesus with our spiritual eyes, if you call yourself a believer and follower of Christ, are the result of seeing and believing the same Jesus they saw with their own eyes and testified through their life with Jesus through their story. And I believe here some of us, if not most of us, maybe all of us, were probably impacted or will be impacted by someone else's story of coming to believe and following him. You know, we want to follow suit, as they did, to our neighbors, co-workers, and friends. You know, within our staff, uh, I know we, we lost a couple staff members, but within, um, there's a running joke uh, within our staff that, you know, every time there is a min ministry community meet gathering, MC gathering, uh, before COVID, uh, that I would have to share my faith story, <laughs> my testimony. Reason being... Uh, when I interviewed for this position four years ago, yeah, I went through a string of meetings. Uh, and, and, and I think through each of them, I shared my faith story. Why? Well, obviously it was important because they need to know who I am. The community that I would want to be in fellowship with wanted to know who I was. You know, my story wasn't a crazy, you know, coming out of the grave type of story, no. Definitely not, but as I kept telling it, I was like, oh, it was a consistent, it seemed like a consistent story of God being faithful and God definitely being faithful in the midst of my recent years, even throughout ministry of hardship, loneliness, pain, struggle. Yeah, I just had to pour out what I had with what I call discerned transparency. And lo and behold, I'm still here. 
Uh, so when I attended my first ministry community gathering, I think it was April of 2017, I shared my testimony. And once I got hired, I shared a few more times after that, I think. I shared more times with my youth group. Some of my youth group kids are here. I think they heard my story quite a few times. Um, and I would share this alongside the Bible teachings that I would do to them, uh, teach them. So if there was a need for a story or a testimony, like on Easter, on stage at, at PLES or any MC gathering, I would jokingly be on standby. Uh, but seriously, as, as I shared during those times, I remember I was less and less anxious because there was a relationship that was being built between me and our church with you and our fellowship in this community was growing. Specifically in 2018 and 2019, I remember being impacted by uh, certain faith stories of our young adults uh, during our, our young adult Vine high definition HD discipleship groups. Uh, to help grow these leaders, it was really beneficial to practicing uh, sharing our stories with one another. And it was really a blessing to hear the story of how they met Jesus and how their lives were impacted despite hardships that they've endured through and how they're living it out now to equip them better to share it with their friends and at their workplaces. And as a response to each person sharing, our group would lay hands on them and pray on his or her behalf. And those are impactful moments, at least for me. It was, it was, it was impactful for me to pray for them and to be prayed for. Um, I remember sharing mine and it was quite long. I think I had 12 years on the youngest or the, in our group. And I don't know if they were bored, but <laughs> I think they were. <laughs> but anyways, it, it, it was impactful because it brought us closer together. And this is what fellowship looked like. You know, by sharing the story, by sharing our story of how it transforms our lives, how Jesus transforms us, we bless others as a part of seeking true fellowship because of our overflow of fellowship with God. My second point is our reluctances uh, to sharing our story. And this is what I'm good at. I'm reluctant in sharing my story. <laughs> Have you ever had that feeling when you're waiting online at a supermarket or playing at a park with your friends or your children or you're just in a conversation and there's something in you that says, oh, I need to tell them about Jesus. Oh, I need to tell them about Jesus. I need to bring out the gospel. I need to ask if they're saved. You want to share something of your story, but you hesitate and then the opportunity is gone. But Pastor Paul, this story is, I mean, sharing your story should be easy for you, right? You're a pastor. <laughs> no, it's not. It's hard. Yeah, I could teach and preach, but sharing my story to my neighbors? I consider myself a quote-unquote lousy evangelist, and let me explain why. So I was listening to a podcast uh, entitled, Help, I'm Afraid to Share My Faith. Um, and the host spoke of his friend, an author who wrote a book on personal evangelism. And this author, one day he was on a plane and he wanted to share the gospel with the person next to him. The person had his headphones on, so he waited. But eventually, they both ended up at baggage claim. They striked up, struck up a conversation. But the guy who he was talking to led and said, I'm so glad you're not one of those evangelical Jesus freaks. Have you ever been on a plane with them? It's the worst. They just go on and on. So the author recognized his own heart at the time. He clammed up and he didn't want to be thought poorly in this random unbeliever's mind. He recalled during that time that calling himself a lousy evangelist. And for me, that was really impactful. If this author of evangelism who wrote a book on personal evangelism is, as he called himself in that situation, a lousy evangelist, then I have hope that I'm not alone in some of the fears that I have. And you may join me in that. To be honest, I get the yips all the time. I hold some guilt when there's an opportunity that I don't jump on. 
I fear what people will think and say in dislike or disapproval, even though I have the promise of God in Scripture. Yeah, the world's going to hate you because it hated Jesus first. And it also, Scripture also says, don't fear. I'm with you. And this is my struggle. Maybe this is your struggle too. Question for us, why do we hold back from sharing our stories? Why are we reluctant? And it's grounded in fear that results in insecurity and discomfort. And I'll describe two based from the book. Number one, we don't have what it takes. Did you ever hear this before? Maybe the fear is kind of like in the back of your mind. We don't have it, what it takes because sharing your story is only for the pastors, teachers, evangelists, super religious people who know the Bible inside out. It's only for the people who have that knack or that gift. It's only for people who can carry a conversation for days. It's only for people who are good at apologetics, who are also good at debate. It's only for the people who followed Jesus for many years, the super faithful. It's only for the people who had that dramatic, radical conver conversion story, who committed to following Jesus during the pits of their utter despair or near death, because those stories create instant impact, right? We don't have what it takes because my story's too boring, man. People don't want to hear that. It's not impactful enough. And we all know lies. All fears that just need to just go away. You and I here, Lighthouse, we do have what it takes to share our story because the story is, is first not about us. It's the dramatic and decisive event of what God the Father did to saving us sinners from death and hell through the sacrifice of his own son, Jesus Christ, so that we have the eternal life with God to come. It's also about the current union we have with him and how that compels us to share it with others. Therefore, when we share the story with our story, with our friends and neighbors, we're not speaking the good news on our own. If we're following Jesus Christ, we do have God's promise that His Spirit is with us to give us the right words and the right time to do it. Matthew 10, 13 says this. We do have what it takes. We do. In 1997, I was a freshman in high school, and that year, I went on my first mission trip to the Dominican Republic uh, with my church at the time. It was actually one of the, the first times experiencing God in a real way. Like I saw spiritual warfare happen in person and that was really scary. Um, but it was also the first time we went out to evangelize, which was scarier. <laughs> One particular night as we were out in our town for uh, our evening revival nights, we go, we go to different villages, we ask people to come, our, our Spanish, our Dominican brothers and sisters have like a really loud music and awesome stuff going on. Uh, and I don't know why I agreed to this, but I was going to share my story <laughs> before the message. I initially thought, yeah, I could do this. Yeah, what, what's so hard about this? But when the time came closer for me to speak, I realized I was not ready. All the, all the lies that we talked about before, <laughs> I was speaking those woefully unprepared. What the crazy am I doing? Who's going to listen to a little guy like me? Why me? Why did I do this? So, you know, I'm like, I can't back out. So I, you know, when it was time for me to speak, I walked up to the, uh, to the stage and I just stood there. I froze. I couldn't speak. <laughs> you know, sweat, everywhere. It's, it's a hot night, but it's also dark, but people are looking at me. So with tears like, uh, like about to stream down my eyes, I just quickly said something along the lines of, and in this speed, Jesus loves you and cares for you so much that he died for you. <laughs> and sprinted off the stage. And the translator translated a lot more slowly, so it was okay, right? 
So embarrassed, I just, I just, I just ran out. I ran off. You know, I wasn't prepared. You know, I was prideful. I was like, you know, I thought I could do it. But at the same time, I was like, what in me compelled me to do that because I have nothing to share? And also, I think my pastor was disappointed in me, and I wasted an opportunity. Um, but I remember my teammates, you know, walking to me after and encouraging me. And I remember one Dominican friend that was leading worship that night. You know, he, like a, a gentle soul, right? He just comes up to me and he, 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 he comes up to me and he, he gives me a hug and he says, it's okay. You talked about Jesus loving and dying for us. So I felt reassured in that time and the pressure seemed to be lifted. And again, I don't know if it impacted others, uh, but it really made me take this to heart that if I want to share my story, I need to believe the story for myself. So the Bible became more real to me during that time. Jesus became more real during that trip. And since then, I've, I think I've learned to write it all down. Think before I speak and pray, asking God to lead me. As I shared my story to friends, teammates, and people in other mission trips after that, over the years, you know, it became, yeah, easier to do. Still hard, but I've grown a lot from that. Our second reluctance to sharing our stories is we don't want to impose our beliefs to family or friends. Uh, we see the stereotypes all around the media today and social media about Christians. Uh, we're angry people. Christians are angry, unkind, unloving, Bible-thumping, judgmental hypocrites, prideful, they lean to one political party or another, and are bad at friendships, and so on and so forth. And of course, that's not us. We don't want to be that. Jesus calls us to be lights in the world, and we're called to stand firm with conviction and courage. You know, however, with all the, the polarization and divisiveness in our world, yeah, we're, we're, we're fearful. We're fearful to, fearful to stand up boldly for what we believe because we don't want to offend others. And so we fear sharing our stories as if it will impose our beliefs and stereotypes. And those things may bubble up, causing more scorn or division or negative thoughts about who we are. With that being said, however, the difference is humbly sharing the difference the gospel story made in your life is not imposing your beliefs on anyone. It's not. As we build friendships with, uh, and trust with our coworkers, our neighbors, we get invited in. And we're not here to impose. But we want to share the reason for the hope we have through our story with gentleness and respect. I love that verse from 1 Peter 3.15. Missiologist um, D.T. Miles says this, Christianity is one beggar telling another beggar where he found bread. If we believe uh, what we have in Christ is good news, the most, the most life-altering, eternity-altering, life-changing news you could ever share, then why wouldn't we want to share it? To keep it to yourself would be like hoarding bread when others are hungry. And yes, it may be comfortable, but at a certain point in time, we, yeah, like we said in the beginning, we have to put our feelings aside and share the words that God would have us speak when its impact and significance can be big in the life of the people you talk to, people like your friends. We, had, we just talked about our reluctances, but my last point for us today is how we can share our stories. And here is a basic framework for telling our story that we can follow that's pretty easy to remember. And we'll look at the testimony of the blind beggar in John chapter 9. So if you have your Bible texts with you, please open up to John chapter 9 and follow along with me. The basic framework is, number one, we've, my life before Jesus. Number two, how I met Jesus. And three, my life since I met Jesus. And we look at, we'll look at John chapter 9. So in John chapter 9, Jesus meets a man who is blind, who's also a beggar. To answer the, the disciples' deep, deep question about sin that caused blindness, 
Jesus answers them by showing them him, his, himself. Jesus displays the glory and his power of God. Miracle. And a miracle happens. Before Jesus, a man is suffering in life without sight and living as a poor beggar. He's an outcast in society, looked down upon by everyone, and probably is shunned by his own family. His life since meeting Jesus, he can now see. His eyes are open and his heart is changed. And he can't help but share what happened. Verse 8 says this, verses 8 through 11. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. Others said, No, but he, he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud, anointed my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. And they said to him, Oh, yeah. And they said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. He can't fully explain how it happened, but he just simply tells them what happened, what Jesus did, and his life is now different. The man is met with disbelief and could potentially have been hindered in sharing what he encountered and witnessed firsthand. But he doesn't. He sticks to what, how Jesus changed his life. As simple as that. And we read, read further, the Pharisees, yes, have this agenda against Jesus. Yes, they seek to undermine him and are unable to accept what happened. And so they threaten his parents. And even the parents respond of course, with fear of being outcasted. And we'll read from 18 to 23. The Jews did not believe he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but how he now sees, we do not know nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. Basically saying, he's a grown man. Ask him yourself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he's of age. Ask him. Our son was born blind, how he sees, we don't know. Ask him. He's a grown man. Even as the man endures these particular insults, he just sticks to his story. Now, I'm not saying like whenever you tell your story, people are going to you know, question it. They might. People may. But for this particular story, they did. He sticks to his story and then he kind of turns the tables and he also, uh, and he takes them to quote unquote Bible school. Verse 30 to 33, the man answered, why this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper, worshiper of God, does his will, God listens to them, him. Never since the world began, it, has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind? If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And so they answered him, you were born in utter sin and you would teach us and they casted him out. He gets kicked out for simply sharing his story. I remember this quote from the same podcast um, and the podcaster said this, don't be what you're not, just pour out what you got. This man kept it real. The good, yes, I can see now. The bad, I'm still a beggar. The ugly, why are you, the Pharisees, trying to shut me up, invalidate me, and kick me out or cancel me? He didn't exaggerate, sensationalize the way it happened. He did not even want to appease people. He just testified of what Jesus did, and his life is now being changed. The same goes for us, and, and here is some practical encouragement for us. 
when you share your story with your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, be yourself. You be you and keep it real. When you share the stories of how things used to be before you found God, how you found your way back, and how things are different now with God in your life. Be open and honest, share the good along with the bad, the joys and the pains. And people will be impacted by your openness. Don't be what you're not, just pour out what you got. The faithfulness of God in the midst of your struggles in this life is what people need to hear. And when we do that with honesty and with authenticity, with wisdom, it's impactful. I have to add this marvelous thing that happens at the end of this chapter. In verse 35 to 38, this is what scripture says. When Jesus heard that they had casted him out and having found him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? He answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you have seen him and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. You know, ultimately, when it all comes down to it's, I believe, it's, it's our desire for the ends of the earth, which includes our unbelieving neighbors and family members. Ultimately, it's our desire for them to worship, to worship God, because simply he is, he just is. God. And we worship God because of his holy love for us. We want people to know Christ is the only one who saves them from certain death and the answer to the deepest question of humanity's heart. Who will fully satisfy us? It's only Christ. And we seek for uh, our coworkers, our neighbors, our friends, our family members to know this. But my question for us today is, do we ourselves know this? Maybe getting ready to bless others, being willing to tell the story means we ourselves do some personal inventory some soul searching on our own about whether or not you set Jesus as Lord of your heart in the very essence or core of who you are. Even as we are ready to share our story to others, do we believe it for ourselves? It's something that I think about whenever I try to share my story. I've heard a lot of sermons about preaching the gospel to yourself. Do we renew the gospel for ourselves so that we can thus share what we have been given? The great news of Christ in his life, death, and resurrection, our, our stance, our righteousness in him to save us, to keep us, and to sustain us, and that people do need to hear that. I struggle doing this, and I, yeah, again, going back to the guilt I feel, I've been living with a few roommates here in in Seattle, and my big regret is I never talk to them about the good news. More than trying to love them, I was just so angry at them, (laughs) frustrated. But inside my heart, I was, I was, I was, was, there's a lot of guilt. Maybe because I was going through my own personal struggles of, of brokennesses and hardships and lonelinesses. And over the recent years, I think I, I, the last time I preached in October, I talked a lot about my personal depression and depressions and, 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 and getting treatment for uh, and counseling and getting physically like sick, headaches, feeling nauseated all the time, losing 24 pounds, 22, 24 pounds over the last year. This is a story. I need to share this. 
And I think during that time, I, I had to remind myself, do I believe this story for myself? I mean, these things are probably going to happen in life. These things are going to happen in your life. Adjustments, changes, transformations. And God gives people, God gives people, God gave me, you guys to, to help cope and, and endure through this. He gives, but most importantly, he gave me his son, he gave me himself. And, and the means and the resources to do that. Thankful for this church providing insurance so I could see as many doctors as I need to. <laughs> to help take care of my own fears and anxieties. I can't explain exactly what happened after uh, I chose to follow Jesus. I know that following Jesus is going to, it's not easy all the time, right? It's going to be hard. You know, I might, ha I might have those, those, those ideal situations and jealousies when I look at, oh, my peers who are married and they have the two kids and they have the, the house and they have the whatever. But that's their particular story. And each of us have distinct stories to, to tell. I just know that since I was saved and resaved and saved again, <laughs> like God's been doing a fantastic work. I may just not realize it. He's been blessing me, sanctifying me as that, that good Christianese word to make me more like Christ, to give me more humility to give me more of a sense of grace as I've been shown grace. So I think when I failed to share with my roommates, even though they irritated me so much, I prayed nonetheless, God, if not me, I know that you, you have people that might share it with them. I, I'm just praying that you give me an opportunity to do so. Each story is different. We can't always explain exactly what happened after we chose to follow Christ. We just know that it happened and share what we have seen and believed. You may not have gained sight like the blind man, but God's saving work through the, cry, uh, through the cross of Christ opened our spiritual eyes. This is the gracious gift of God to us, and we are called to believe that for ourselves. Friends, Lighthouse, God is faithful to complete the work he began in us the moment we've trusted in him. He's the author and perfecter of our faith. If we trust him at his word, he has a great promise for us. We just need to share this promise to people as well because that's the promise for them in the Lord's will, in the Lord's sovereign will. To close, you know, Lighthouse's mission is what? To share God's grace and truth so that people come to know, love, and serve Jesus, right? And I encourage you to do that. Share God's grace and truth every day. Speak that to yourself. Pray that to the Lord. Help me do that. I encourage you that all who are part of this body practice, this, practice that by using the acronym B-L-E-S-S. -S. One family member, one friend at a time in your workplaces, in your community groups who don't know Jesus, and even randomly on the, on the street. Grounded and beginning with prayer, listen with intention, eat together with people that we're praying for and listening to, and serve others by meeting their needs in impactful ways. You share the story of how you met Jesus and how he's transformed your life up till now so that people come to know, love, and serve Jesus and bless as they've been blessed. Let's pray. Father, you give us uh, the, the, the calling to, to share your truth with love, and that's what you've given Lighthouse, to share the story of our lives. And we do it with humility and respect. God, you've given us a story because the story is first and foremost about you and your gracious love for us. Lord, I pray that you give us boldness and courage. And yes, definitely when necessary, because it is necessary to use our words. God, you've given us a tremendous blessing. Your spirit lives in us and we're identified as children of God, co-heirs with Jesus first and foremost. 
May we share that truth to the people in our community, in our nation, in our cities, until your kingdom comes. We glorify you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Pastor Paul.
Let's pray. First Peter three fourteen and 15 says this, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear in them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ as the Lord, as holy, always being prepared to make in the defense to anyone asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you, yet you do it with gentleness and respect. Well, that's our prayer, that's our call, that's our exhortation for today, for this week, for us. Um, 
that because of your grace, because of your love, because of your goodness, because of who you are and you have called us to be, that we can give and we are called to give the reason for the hope that we have and our hope is in Christ and your glory and your goodness. So be glorified. Uh, may this be spoken to all of our hearts and tr uh, really, um, yeah, spoken to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me take your seats. Uh, some announcements before we close. Today is the last post-service Zoom prayer room meet meeting. Uh, so for those who want to receive prayer and, and those who want to pray for, other, pray for others, um, it will be open today. We will transition into next week in person on Saturdays, but you can always request prayer during our, uh, through our website at any time. And just to reiterate, uh, we're excited for the opportunity to worship together next week at, at ECS Saturday, July 31st, Eastside Christian School. And our service will begin at the same time at 10 a.m. Mask wearing will be optional. I think that's all for today. Uh, have a blessed week, everyone. Go with the Lord and serve Him and serve one another. <laughs>